My name is Jamie Heinemann. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for John Deere. And that really means I've got responsibility for, we would call it our end-to-end -end technology stack. So that's our embedded software, embedded hardware, our digital software like John Deere Operations Center, and, um, and then the automation and autonomy work that we take on on behalf of uh, the production systems that we serve. And what brought you to Australia? Yeah, mostly to learn about Australian agriculture. So it's uh, it's a different, agriculture has some similarities across the globe, but there are certainly differences as well by market. So it really was a, a learning expedition, if you will, to, to better understand Australian agriculture. And what struck you the most? Oh, I, I think um, a handful of things. I think the, you know, one, one of the significant um, differences in Australian agriculture is the, the pressure on the grower is different. The constraints around agriculture are different. And, you know, for example, the, the constraint around water and water availability. Um, that's not unique to Australia, but it's most significant probably in Australian agriculture. And I think that drives growers to actually, um, especially since there's no subsidies for agriculture, it drives growers to be more innovative. Um, you know, to take more risk, they shoulder more of the risk of the business themselves. And so they're always looking for solutions that can mitigate that risk and make their operations more efficient. Um, and I think the drive to do that is greater here than it probably is just about anywhere else in the world. I think you might have once said that John Deere employs more software engineers than mechanical engineers. Is, is that true? Uh, and if so, why is that so surprising to people? Yeah. Well, I think it's surprising to people because we're a, a durable goods manufacturer in most people's minds, right? The, the uh, infamous John Deere tractor and combine, et cetera, that's what you know, the images that get conjured up when you hear about the brand and that, um, that elevates this idea of mechanical engineering as a, a competency and it certainly still is. We still need that, right? We still need to produce the best equipment on the planet, the most efficient tractors, uh, the most productive pieces of equipment, but increasingly, you know, part of the, the opportunity in front of us is to think about farming as a system, right? Not just the individual machines that execute the work on the farm, the tractor, sprayer, combine, but you know, how do those pieces of equipment work together? How do they work um, within the ecosystem that, that is the grower's environment uh, with additional data that's coming in? How do you deploy technology across those pieces of equipment to make them learn from one another and get better? Uh, as a consequence of, of the data that comes from one. So for example, how do I use my seeding data uh, that comes off my tractor and seeder to make the spraying operation that I'm gonna go do better, right? That's a, we use, AutoPath is a good example of that where we use you know, the, 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 the tracks that were made, the guidance tracks that were made during the planting operation to help inform where the sprayer should go in the spraying operations and finally where the combine should go. Uh, and so those are software intensive exercises, right? That's so software intensive value creation opportunities, which is why you know, we have a, a significant uh, number of software developers in the organization today and have a nearly insatiable appetite to add more. You've been with John Deere for almost 30 years. Looking back over your career, is there a piece of technology you think has been the biggest game changer? There's so much that we build off of guidance. If you think of the auto track, um, you know, Aqu Navcom acquisition 25 years ago, and this idea that you could um, locate a machine on the surface of the planet with a high degree of precision, right? And today that's two and a half centimeters of precision. Um, that has unlocked all sorts of opportunities. It's certainly unlocked the opportunity to th things like yield mapping. Uh, prior to, to having guidance on machines and GNSS capability on machines, yield mapping wasn't a possibility. It certainly unlocked uh, and laid the foundation, I would argue, for uh, autonomy in the future. Um, not really in the future, it's happening as we speak, I guess. Um, and, and so if you, I, I think that one um, technology 25 years ago and the investment that we made in it 25 years ago has really set the stage for a lot of what's happening today. It's not the only thing. If I had to pick something else, I'd say connectivity is another one, right? The ability to get information, uh, data bi-directionally, both off the equipment, but also back to the equipment so that um, farmers can make better decisions, not just within the growing season, but from growing season to growing season. Yeah, connectivity, massive issue in Australia, particularly in those growing and farming regions. Uh, tell me about this partnership with Starlink, SpaceX, what that's going to mean for farmers and growers yeah. in Australia. I'll tell you the full story from the, from the beginning. So um, it's been 18 months ago, we uh, 
we asked the, the players in the, the satellite connectivity industry uh, to meet us on Jensen Farms uh, in the mid Midwest, right in, in uh, near Ankeny, Iowa, and we invited them to the farm shed. And they were all wondering, uh, we're satellite people, why are we meeting on a farm in the middle of Iowa? Uh, but we had most of the major industry players there, and, and we challenged them that day in the shop uh, and, and told them the opportunity in agriculture uh, was, was great uh, if we could just solve for this connectivity bit, right? Uh, because there are so many places where agriculture by definition generally happens in rural locations that are poorly connected, right? Um, and so much of the technology that's not just here today but is coming is connectivity dependent. Uh, and so the growers don't, <clears throat> they fundamentally don't benefit until connectivity happens. And it was sort of an, an enlightening um, conversation in the shop and they understood maybe for the first time the opportunity in agriculture that as, uh, as people that work in space all day they don't necessarily think about. Um, they saw it as an attractive market and we, we challenged them to put together a, <clears throat> um, proposals that we could then go validate and see if they meet our needs. And we had some re you know, requirements around cost and performance of the system, those sorts of things. Um, two, uh, two of the, the companies put together um, prototype systems that we were capable of testing. We've tested those over the last uh, 12 months in field, both in, in the U.S. and in Brazil, uh, on a variety of equipment and a variety of production systems and applications. Uh, and really settled on Starlink as the, the, the one that provided the best cost to benefit ratio, if you will, um, and, and was willing to help customize the, the hardware for agricultural environments and purposes. Uh, so we're super excited about that. We're going to, uh, we're, we're being paced actually right now by their development process. So they're in the midst of, of creating uh, a new version of a satellite terminal, version four uh, of their terminal. That's the version that, that we will be, uh, they're, they're customizing on our behalf and we'll, we'll use uh, for the ag use cases. Um, that will start production for them early this year. We'll be able to certify that in both the, the U.S. and Brazilian markets hopefully this year on a, a limited production basis and then go to full production in those markets next year. Um, but once that's um, in production, it also gives us the opportunity to certify it with the various governmental entities in other countries like Australia, Canada, etc. So that's sort of step two behind this is getting the, the hardware certified and capable of operating in, in this country uh, moving forward. And you know, the, the it, it's as, I, I call it a zero to one proposition, right? It's when you go from no connectivity to connectivity, there are, it just opens up a world of opportunities. Um, and I, I think the, uh, the agricultural use case is one where the, the value can be immense. And uh, I'm really excited actually to see where it all goes. Yeah, and farmers obviously would have to buy a new receiver for their machine. Yeah, we're gonna start with, uh, it, it's a uh, field retrofittable, right? So you, you buy the, the terminal, the modem, and a power supply. Uh, and put it on a piece of equipment. It, uh, any, any piece of equipment that has a 4G LTE, LTE MTG today. Um, the MTG is used to be the ethernet bridge for the, the connectivity source. So um, yeah, put it on a piece of existing equipment and you have connectivity. Can you tell me about electrification and what that is going to be for farm machinery? Um, yeah, to be determined I think is the, the, the answer. It, if you look at where the state of um, lithium ion chemistries are for um, volumetric power density and gravimetric power density, so weight density and, and volume power density, um, the, the sort of natural breaking point for us is about 100 kilowatts. So 100 kilowatts and under, it makes sense in certain, it, it makes technical sense to, um, or it's technically feasible is probably the right way to describe it to replace an internal combustion engine with a, a battery powered piece of equipment. It's duty cycle dependent, you know, it's certainly power dependent, um, and, but it, it's possible to do. The economics of it in those smaller machines are still challenged. It's still more costly than an internal combustion engine is to, to produce it at the moment. But costs are coming down for, um, for battery electric and, and with the emission requirements becoming more, more uh, restrictive for internal combustion engine, the cost of those are going up. So um, I'm, I'm bullish on the opportunity in the small powered segment portion of the product line. If you look at our large equipment, if you look at production agriculture uh, as an example, you know, an 8R tractor, we designed that tractor today to run for 14 hours at 75% full load rated speed. So the amount of energy that that machine consumes is enormous. The, 
you know, I, I, the, the math would say you need 39 Tesla Model 3 batteries to, to equ equivalent the amount of fuel that we can carry on board that machine. And if you just picture that mental, mental image in your mind, it's not tractable, right? It, it completely changes the machine form. The size of the machine gets significantly bigger. The weight of the machine gets significantly higher. And it just, it, it doesn't make sense. So I think in those larger pieces of equipment, uh, a more um, near-term opportunity for us are bridge fuels, things like renewable diesel, biodiesel, those sorts of things that um, farmers grow themselves. It's got this nice circular economy uh, feature to it. Uh, that they can then use to help power the equipment that grows more crops that then can be turned into more fuel, et cetera, and so on. Um, I think that's a, a better solution, especially in the near term, at some of the higher power levels. Yeah, so uh, we're due 2026 in Australia to, to get a, a, an electric tractor. So are we talking up to about the 5 ml type of? Yeah, five, five series tractors is kind of the upper end. Um, I do think there, there is an opportunity in some of our equipment to hybridize. Uh, so a combination of internal combustion engine and battery electric to downsize you know, the, the internal combustion engine and, and offload some of the power requirements to a battery. Um, but yeah, the, the pure battery electric 5 series tractor. Uh, automation, uh, another massive trend we talk a lot about. Most drivers have been using automation for years, lane assist, emergency braking. Um, we've got auto track turn automation uh, in John Deere equipment. Has it been a deliberate strategy just to kind of roll this in slowly so people get used to it? Yeah, our path to full autonomy is paved on these stepping stones of automation. Um, you know, you look at the, the tractor uh, as uh, the, the first use case from an autonomy perspective and um, fundamentally what we've done is, is conditioned uh, operators, um, farmers to um, utilize automation, in this case AutoTrack, over the course of two decades until they got to the point where they're asking us, why am I still here, right? Why don't you just remove me? This is the, the, fun, the, the, the job that this is doing doesn't require me in the cab any longer, right? And so we have to solve the perception problem from a safety perspective, but the jobs have been automated enough, especially in the tillage application, that um, there's, there's a high degree of confidence from a customer perspective that we can go do this. Um, we have to you know, earn the right to have that level of confidence from the customers in some of the other jobs. If you think of seeding, planting, uh, harvesting, spraying, we have to continue this step of increasing the level of automation in those machines until you get to the point where an operator, a, a, a customer would tell you, I don't need to be here anymore either. Uh, and then we've earned the right to, to make that product, to make that job fully autonomous. Okay, so what kind of time frames are you looking at for that cultivating? Yeah, 2030 in corn and soy production systems is how we characterized it uh, to have a fully autonomous production system. Um, that's going to bleed over into other production systems because some of the jobs are common and consistent, right? So if you look at the tillage application, it won't just be tillage in corn and soy, obviously it can be tillage in other, other uh, crop types and production systems. Um, but that's our, that's our target is by 2030 to be able to say we can execute autonomously in, in all the job steps uh, in a corn and soy production system. 2023 was the year AI really kind of arrived in the public conscious, consciousness as well with chat GPT. How long has John Deere been working with it? Because I know you're, you've got a lot of background in AI. How long has John Deere been working on AI solutions? Yeah, um, long time. So Sea and Spray would be probably the most notable uh, commercial offering that we have that relies on AI. So it is a, a convolutional neural network that's looking at uh, these you know, 36 cameras across a 120 foot boom. Uh, processing 5 billion pixels a second and discriminating pixels that have weeds in them from pixels that don't have weeds in them, right? And then we only spray the areas for the pixels that have weeds in them. Uh, that's, uh, that's AI on the edge, if you will. It's all happening in graphical processing units that are sitting on that sprayer, right? Uh, so all the, the, the math is, is happening on the machine. You talk about chat GPT and generative AI, uh, it, it, these transformer models that are coming into existence now, they're super interesting to us for a variety of reasons. One is the, the training that has to happen for us on some of these models like Sea and Spray are, uh, because of the ag cycle being an annual cycle, uh, the collection of the training data is a long process, right? We have to collect data. You know, in the case of, the weed doesn't look the same on day one of emergence out of the ground as it does on day five or day 10. 
doesn't look the same in low light conditions as it does in sunlight conditions. It doesn't look the same in soil type A as it does in soil type B. So if you want the models to generalize well, you have to take um, a, a generalized set of training data and you have to find these corner conditions where you know, the weed looks slightly different here than it did here, right? Or it's a slight genetic variation here than it was here. That's time consuming, it's laborious. We actually go out, people go out with backpacks and cameras and collect this data. Like you can think of the, you know, the energy and the effort that has to go into this. One of the interesting opportunities with generative AI is for some of those corner conditions and those use cases, the, the, the hard to get data to be um, manufactured, right? So can you uh, ask the, 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 the transformer model to generate an image of you know, a radish weed at you know, three weeks old uh, in low light conditions and use that to augment your training data set if you don't have that, that image in there already. I think that that has the opportunity to speed up the, the model development for us and allows us to get into more applications more quickly. We've spoken all about this technology, these changes that have happened in, in your career. What are the skills that farmers are going to need in the future? Are they going to need to be tech savvy or computer savvy, engineering savvy? What do you see? Or is it going to get easier? Yeah, I, I do think, um, I think it's incremental. Like you still have to know agriculture. They have to know what they know today, right? But they're also going to have to be tech savvy uh, moving forward. Like technologies, it's true in areas outside of agriculture also, right? The, the impact of technology in our lives is, is significant and growing and will continue to grow. The same thing is happening in the agricultural industry. So I think this, um, this, there is this need to think about the skill sets on the farm and how do they change? Uh, what's additive? What do you still need to have that, that you can't let go of? Um, and what does that look like over the next five, 10, you know, 15 years? I think operating a, operating a farm autonomously is very different than not doing that, right? There are certain skill sets associated, and not just skill sets, but um, the way you farm is going to be different. We talked about that a little bit this morning. The, the notion that I no longer have to be in this piece of equipment to operate it, it's a freeing idea, like you're given the gift of time when, when that's a possibility. So what do you do with that time? Like, how do you plan your day differently? Um, what, do you, what are the constraints around how you plan your day because you're going to have to move the machine from you know, paddock to paddock to paddock. Um, how does that change how you, how, you, how you approach the activities of the day? And um, all of those sorts of things are, are new, right, as technology happens on the farm. I think the, the wonderful thing about agriculture is it's always been impacted by new things, new innovations. It's one of the most innovative industries, I think, on the planet. So farmers are very adept at adapting, right? They're very adept at internalizing new things and, and understanding how they can benefit them, and then modifying the farm to, to accommodate. All right, Jamie, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Likewise.